Hello, welcome back to the Donahue Group. We're feisty and ready to talk about state issues and maybe just segue a little bit into how the national issues just uh, force their way into state politics. Um, I'm Mary Lynn Donahue, the host of this uh, often difficult to control group, but joining me today, Cal Potter, former state senator. <laughs> Very difficult to control. Yeah. <laughs> just bad people off camera here. Tom Paneski, University of Wisconsin Sheboygan uh, mathematics professor. Ken Risto, dress to match the set. This color and the color of our beautiful new set is just a very, very nice palette. He and Martha Stewart were in consultation this very morning. I hired a media advisor. <laughs> it was her, her money I got and her talent. <laughs> I got him cheap from the John McCain campaign. He was cut loose and No, no, and no, no. This, this is, uh, but the rest of us, you know, are just all blending in with this. This is actually a very nice new set and we're, yeah. we're just kidding, but it, it is nice to be here. It doesn't feel quite so cramped and, and so we appreciate that. And the sun clock for the sun god. Um, we are in that great uh, time of um, state government when they're trying to pass the budget, trying to construct and deconstruct and sausage making, sausage mm -hmm. making at its best with all sorts of vile parts in it. Um, Cal, you were part of that process for many, many years, and uh, I, things have changed somewhat, have they not? Uh, in terms of how all of this works, or is it still pretty much the same? Well, I, I had the, of all the 24 years I spent in two houses, um, only two years of it was I, uh, in the minority. That was two years in the mid-90s when the Republicans controlled the state Senate. Um, when you have split houses, it makes things very, very difficult, of course, because you end up uh, with no agreement uh, come July 1, because there's usually a radical difference in the packages passed in respective houses. Um, for many years, Tommy Thompson, almost 16 years, dominated Wisconsin's governorship as a Republican, but we had democratically controlled uh, legislatures for many of those years. And so what you had is you had Tommy's version of the budget, and then you had the legislative version of the budget. What has really changed now is you've got uh, a Senate version of the budget, you had the governor's budget, which went to the Senate and was modified, but not drastically. But then the assembly came in with their own version, which was radically different. And so when it goes to what is known as a conference committee to resolve the differences between the two houses, you have a, uh, just a Herculean attack, uh, task to resolve the differences because they're so far apart. Um, there were a lot of fee increases, particularly uh, in, in the uh, uh, Senate version, emanating many from the governor. Uh, particularly fees on, on user type things in real estate and other types of areas where the governor is trying to raise revenues for specific programs that he thinks are tied to in some way to that program or the constituency of that program. Well, uh, when you're the Republicans in the assembly who have just lost the Senate, don't have the governorship anymore, a fee is a tax and therefore you're not going to go along with any type of tax because you want the Senate back and you want to keep the assembly and they are within three seats of losing the assembly. So you need to have some type of very steadfast message and that's what's coming out of the assembly. No taxes, no fees. But the problem is you have to finance state government. It costs money. There are inflationary costs. Uh, gasoline costs alone for uh, you know, school districts and municipalities and so on, and the state as well, uh, gobble up an increased amount of budget every, every two years. And so as a result, they do need more revenue. And that's what we're having a problem with, is you've got two radically different budgets in two houses going to a conference committee, and there's no need for any side to compromise quickly. The problem is the taxpayers and the people of Wisconsin need a budget as of July 1. And here we are, as we tape, almost middle of August, and we don't have any really serious movement towards resolution. So what will what will change? And I, I remember in the in the Tommy Thompson days, weren't there just budgets that were months and months and months overdue? There were some times when there was a delay, and it uh, because there wasn't agreement, and it did go off into. Uh, I think the latest I've ever seen it was usually October. Then the the, the fire starts to heat up 
because, uh, as, as Tom knows, and the people who've been in yourself, who are in school boards and municipal bodies, mm -hmm. you need your share revenue forecast, you need your school aid forecast, you can't print a property tax bill by the middle of December and send it out for everybody, uh, unless you've got all those local aids delineated, and that goes all the way from transportation to shared revenue. So the heat will be on these people as you get closer to fall to finally resolve it because people uh, on the local level who are the decision makers and, and people who have to run the local uh, services are saying, hey kids, you know, stop throwing sand, get serious. You gotta have a budget, whether it's now or later, it's gonna be a budget. You might as well do it now because it'll make life a lot easier for all of us who need to know what our, our aid payments are. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, well, just uh, you mentioned uh, getting serious as deadlines come. I think uh, the president uh, of the UW system is already suggesting that fees be raised for the Madison and Milwaukee and the four-year universities because school is starting mm -hmm. in September and they, he doesn't figure the budget's going to be done. So. Uh, and it's a jump. It's a 5%, 5.4% yeah. increase in tuition. And the UW colleges, uh, he let uh, stay uh, with no increase, which, uh, which uh, at least this is the uh, President Riley. Mm -hmm. So he's suggesting to the Board of Regents, and they're going to take it up uh, next week. Yeah. And uh, see if they go ahead and raise the fees. Because they, they have to know, uh, and the yeah. institutions uh, have to function. So it's already taking yeah. place. And I, this, the assembly, and I'm going to make some partisan shots here, the assembly didn't, <laughs> didn't do a very good job, I think, of portraying a conservative budget. Uh, if I would have been them, I would have simply said, we're going to freeze it and pass the same budget that you had two years ago, and that way we're responsible. We're not raising spending. We're not doing it. What they did is, in many cases, they, they cut certain programs, and they did some pet uh, programs that are... Democrats are taking pot shots at, for example, uh, tax exemption for gold bullion dealers. Well, you know that doesn't fly very well. Um, they, ex <laughs> they, they ex for a constituency that they Chicken wanted. Chicken bullion to is one thing, you <laughs> know, beef bullion, but, but not bullion gold. Uh, uh, right. um, they extended Milwaukee School of Choice to Racine County. Um, you know, now there, and at the same time, they took some programs such as homestead property tax relief which is, has historically gone to anybody of modest and low income um, to help them pay their property tax. What they've done with it, they've modified it uh, to in order to free up money for these other programs that they passed. They've modified it so it only applies to people 65 and over. Well, here you got a widow, 64 years of age, who's making $14,000 a year if she's lucky, who's now going to be in agony over how, whether she's going to have homestead property tax relief to help her pay her property tax. Well. Democrats are naturally going to kick the Republicans in the assembly in the rear end on that issue. I, they ought to be kicked in the rear end. Why should you put somebody who's of modest income, a woman, a, a widow, through anguish because you wanted to free up money for Milwaukee school choice being extended to Racine or bull, gold bullion dealers? You know, so what they've done is they've created a package that has a lot of fodder for political uh, barbs from the Democrats. So as this goal, game goes on, and you're seeing these, these uh, Molotov cocktails being thrown at each other, uh, well, there, there's a genesis of this assembly budget that has created this fire. If they were simply would have, like I said, extended the budget of what we have today, they probably would have less of this uh, hostility that's now going on. And I think um, some, of the, some of the proposed cuts have had the opposite effect of really energizing constituents that may not have paid all that much attention to the state budget, which goes on forever, and who knows what's in it finally. Um, Senator um, Assemblyman Lassay uh, from Green Bay, Frank, right? Yeah. Not mm -hmm. Alan. Frank Lassay has suggested uh, cutting all state funding for the university. Well, that was passed by the Assembly to cut funding for the law school. Uh, right. One of the best law schools in the country. One of the best law schools in the country. There are only two law schools in, in, in the state of Wisconsin to cut all state funding. At the same time that we're saying, and certainly one might take issue with whether or not we're short of prosecutors in Sheboygan County, but those people come from law schools, and the, the, the Wisconsin law schools don't generate all that many lawyers, but, um, uh, and people don't particularly like lawyers until, of course, they need one, and then Everybody my lawyer, lawyer is the best, best thing uh, in the world. Um, but also cutting funding for uh, public radio 
and uh, television. And, and television. Yes. And uh, by all measures, those are... Um, it was the first in a nation, public radio. Oh, is and that right? I yes. didn't know that. 1917. Oh. 1917. And uh, it's considered one of the best in the country. If yeah. you look at today, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, as Mike, uh, the, the programs uh, that emanate out of Wisconsin, many of them are picked up by national radio. Mm -hmm. They're such, a, such quality. Yeah. Now, I don't have all the, the details, you probably have a little more, but I would take issue with the word cut. Uh, it's, uh, you, the Democrats propose so much and the Republicans propose a little less, so the Democrats say it was a cut when it's really a, a increase. So I would take the issue with the word cut. You use cut in a couple of places on the um, Republicans cut the budget. I, I don't know. Uh, my guess is they probably increase the budget, but not as much as the Democrats. So the Democrats, yeah, it's a cut. Well, and, and that, and, and there is some truth to that. But the the public, the, the funding for public radio and and, and the, the law school, as I understand, is elimination. I so, said property tax for the time. It's cutting, yeah. gutting the program. Yeah, like yeah. Excuse me. I mean, you can say the governor's asked for three million dollars, oh. and um, we'll give you uh, two million. Right, so and so and that's right. It's a cut. Sure, and I and, and that's that's a political tack I think that's used on both sides. You know, depending on who can gore what ox, but uh, it's um, it the, was some poor decisions by I think a number of people in the conservative Republican caucus in the assembly, who are the clones of of, of they were legislative aides. They've not done very much else in their life. They ran for the legislature. They were sent out. They won. They come back and they think it's cute to uh, start playing games with programs, cut the law school, cut homestead property tax relief, and do things like that, that there's not a lot of thought there. And uh, I think if what Tom's talking about, the overall budget, they didn't, they might be a 3% increase rather than a 6% increase, you know, relative, but they did some stupid cuts and stupid right. things in that document that people who are custodians of the public service and will shouldn't have done. And they wouldn't, they're paying the price for it by having a lot of criticism because of some of those well, particular it, decisions. Yeah, I mean, all. it energizes the, you know, the opposing base. Sure. And, and, and creates bases, like you said, people yeah. who are in those programs. I'm sure the, the ARP and other uh, coalition of aging groups are not happy about what happened to uh, homestead property tax relief, even though it applies still to people 65 and over. There are a lot of people who are under 65 who doggone well need help paying their property tax. Yeah, it's, well, it, it'll be interesting, and um, I, I do have to remember that Frank Lassay was the person who had suggested that, that was going to introduce a bill requiring all teachers to carry guns, and um, in response, I think, to the, uh, the, the tragic school shooting in, in um, Casanova? No, I'm sorry, the one that's just been on trial. She was um, just found guilty. And just found guilty. Um, but Stephen Colbert had a, a great report on that, and that just the then the title of the report talking about Frank Lassay's proposal was um, chalk and awe. <laughs> I just I just thought that was pretty cute, and and who knows what it's, it's, well, I attacking mean, lawyers I is not quite. Time, I it's, spend it's, obviously it's, a lot of time with high school teachers, and you don't want us armed. <laughs> You really and that includes yours truly. <laughs> I, I think this conflict the is group probably that can't a shoot plus. straight. <laughs> you know, like you said, you served, and it was generally you either had the common, you might have had a different governor, but you had, yeah, you had a Republican governor, but both the House and the Senate were usually the uh, same party. Only a couple of years they were different. Okay. So I think this is a plus that they could, uh, I'm not, I don't think the Democratic ideas are the greatest. Uh, I won't, uh, and you don't like the Republican ideas. So I think. If, and of course, in the, ultimately, in the end, Governor Doyle's going to line iron veto whatever they send forward, and then it'll be altogether different. But I think this is a plus because then you really have to argue about priorities. And uh, spending seems to be a priority for the Democrats, and holding the line on taxes or fee increases, what you call it, is, seems to be a, a policy of the, the assembly. So, well, I think and then you have to figure out what, what's important and what's not. Where yeah. the de Democrats really don't have to give. It's going to mm -hmm. be the pressure on the yeah. Republicans. But. but I just think overall tax policy really is a policy, and it's a question of who pays what. And so I, I, don't, I don't think that either political party wants to not have taxes because taxes is the source of their power. It's just who pays 
and, and, how, and how things get distributed, and I think that's the big philosophical difference. But launching from that grand philosophical thought to, I think, a really excellent debate that is going on at a, at a fairly high level in the legislature, and I think around the state, and who would have thunk five years ago that we would be talking as a state and really as a nation in some respects about universal health care. That if, if, if you're sick, you ought to be able to get to a doctor or to a health care yeah. facility. Now the um, uh, Senate has passed uh, by all measure a fairly comprehensive, maybe a little scary, uh, uh, plan for universal health care coverage. Uh, still maintaining private insurance and, 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 and so forth, a lot of third-party payor systems. It's, my understanding is that Governor Doyle's support for the Senate plan is not overwhelming. Uh, clearly, the Assembly is, is not interested. But even in the Assembly, I think there's, a there's discussion about how do we provide health care for people who don't have access to it. We're a civilized society, and if my brother needs to go see a doctor about his arthritis, he ought to be able to do that even if he doesn't have insurance. Or I do a lot of social well, we security disability work, so in my office weekly I see people who just don't go to the doctor because, mm -hmm. I mean, if they get really bad they'll go to an emergency room, but they have lots and lots of significant untreated chronic health problems that just there's no access to care. Yeah. So I, I think it's interesting that at least the discussion is on the table. Yeah. I mean, as the, even the Wisconsin's made the editorial of the Wall Street Journal as a, we're the model to look at, meaning we're the guinea pig for socialist kind of medicine for our states around the country. But it's interesting, and relatively few people are talking about, we used to talk about socialized medicine, <gasps> this terrible thing. The ground, to me at least, has shifted considerably the Wall Street Journal editorial page, of course, will go you know, up in flames talking about socialized medicine. But most people of all political persuasion are talking about how do you access health care? I mean, we're all offended by Walmart people working full time and not being able to go to the doctor. Or, or being dumped on public programs. Exactly. And then exactly. people complain about public welfare and public tax dollars being used to help these poor people. Yeah. Who should it be? If you're a private, uh, good capitalist, you ought to say that the private sector ought to take care of that. Yeah. And we all know that Medicare is, I mean, say what you will, is incredibly efficient and has provided universal health care for those who you know, fit within the, the criteria. And they do it efficiently and quietly, and it all gets done. Uh, so, I mean, that's socialized medicine, certainly, in a, in a, in a certain way. But um, I I'm, think we ought to face the issue. It's, it's political power who, that's preventing this from occurring. And it's a philosophy among some people, particularly in the private sector, who is saying it is not the responsibility of the, uh, an employer to provide that type of benefit to their employee. Their employees out on their own in the area of health care. However, that's a little hypocritic because what, are they, what do we do when they're injured on the job? We have workers' compensation. Every state has it. Uh, when somebody's laid off and you lose your job, what do you do? You go on unemployment compensation. It's a government program. Everybody in the private sector buys into it and provides it. We just have not taken that next leap and said, well, maybe when people are sick, it's kind of like when you lose your job and when you get injured on a job, somebody ought to help you. And we just haven't taken that list, that, that, that next step. And we've seen, there was an editorial in a local paper from one of the executives from one of the small business groups. Again, espousing the idea that health care is an individual responsibility. Well, if you don't have a job, you don't have much income, your employer refuses to provide you with that health care, you've got a pre-existing condition, where the hell are you supposed to get health care? You know, somebody ought to step forward and do it, and the private mm -hmm. sector ought to do it. I think they ought to. I think it, if you want to, if you believe in capitalism and you believe in the strong private sector, it's no different than we provide public schools and public roads and public airports and workers' compensation and a lot of basic things. This is a basic thing, and we ought to use our collective brain power to find out how we can get it done. 
but we just have not bought into that because we have all of these high paid lobbyists who are saying, oh, not my insurance company might be damaged or my drug company might be damaged or my HMO might be damaged. So we can't change the system. We talked about in the last program how we can't change government because if somebody's ox is going to be gored. And that's what's happened here. We got the status quo, but 47 million people need relief and need help and somebody ought to step forward and start doing something about it. But at least the discussion, a round of applause, I think, for <laughs> It started. <laughs> You're right. You're right. You're right. Certainly but, passionate about it. Yeah. But yeah. I, I am amazed at, and that's been my philosophy, but certainly not a universally shared philosophy. Um, you know, what does it mean to be in a civilized society? Uh, but the discussion is on the table, and everybody is talking about it, and there are lots of plans out there. And so there are still some you know, rumblings about socialized medicines and so forth, but I think that's really gone by the way. Sure. Um, not completely, of course, but it's, there was an article, an editorial in the Green Bay Press Gazette that was featured in the Plymouth Review this past week um, that I thought had a good suggestion, which is take, this is such a big discussion and is such a huge allocation of everybody's resources. Take it out of the budget bill, make it a standalone bill, and there are tons of different permutations on that on that uh, Senate plan uh, and some that are completely dramatically different some that are you know much more government oriented um, but get it on the table and just have a high quality high powered debate about how we're going to solve the problem small employers in all honesty Cal can't afford to cover their employees I mean uh, any reasonable family plan these days is going to cost between twelve and fifteen hundred dollars a yes. month. I mean that's that's a whole different thing than paying a minimum wage, which I frankly think anybody can pay, you know, five mm -hmm. sixty eight an hour and then, you know, you know, in a couple of years seven twenty five. Let's let's pay a living wage of ten dollars an hour. People can afford that, but twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a month for and that still has high out of pocket deductibles and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. The system's not doing too well. And uh, Medicare, I think, say what you will, has fixed a whole lot of problems and has made a lot of people very rich, but has also helped a lot of people. Provided, kept my mom alive. Yeah. Uh, you know, without Medicare, my mom would have died at age 52. You know, <coughs> and she lived to be 78 yeah. and had a good life. And it's because of Medicare. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Medicaid. It's, and you know, medical assistance, you know. Yeah, we, we think of it oftentimes as people on welfare, but most of your aged people, once they, their value of their house is gone and their bank account's gone, if you're in a nursing home, some type of custodial type <coughs> care, it's the government that's helping you out. So we made a system to take care of our elderly to work. Uh, and it takes care of people no matter whether you're injured, you know, at age 15, you're in a nursing home or whatever, somebody's taking care of you through medical assistance. Yeah. Well, we, Cal and I have been hopping up and down about this. You're rarely quiet. Any thoughts on this? Well, I, I think the reason why there's a discussion is because it's, it is starting to hit everybody, and it's pitting people against people. I mean, the Sheboygan Area School District teachers have a, uh, really a very, very, very good uh, medical policy. Um, and then uh, we have now a discussion in the city of Sheboygan about possibly privatizing some services that's being discussed. And I suspect that it's not going to make city of government more efficient. I mean, I watch the guys in my neighborhood pick up trash, and they're moving. They're mm -hmm. moving a lot faster than I would be moving. They're working hard. So if there's going to be money and savings being made, they're going to do what the Sheboygan Area School District did, is throw a lot of reasonably decent paid uh, janitors out the door and replace it with minimum wage people with no benefits. And, so what we're having is literally, uh, my concern is a race to the bottom, you know, exactly. where all of a sudden public employees have to defend uh, what was a reasonable health care package. <clears throat> some can argue maybe we need higher deductibles and, and we need to make some, uh, some fine tuning. But it's a race to the bottom where pretty soon the city employees won't have it and then, we'll, then they'll come after the teachers. And by the time we get done, you've really, for lack of a better word, ghettoized medical care in the, in the, in the county, in the city of Sheboygan. What galls me a little bit is when you, and I know that the district doesn't talk much about this out loud, is that there are a lot of people in the private sector who beat up on 
uh, public employee programs, but are perfectly comfortable, and I've said this before in this show, perfectly comfortable funneling their own employees to those programs. Mm -hmm. And I, yes. I, I find that pretty appalling. So I, I think eventually we're going to probably try something like Massachusetts and see if it works as the first step toward trying to get coverage to everyone in a reasonable way. You know, I know Hillary got pilloried about, uh, Hillary got pilloried, not bad, um, about her health care plan because it's so complicated. Well, it's a complicated thing, especially if you don't want socialized or one payment system. You just don't. Mm -hmm. If people don't want to do that, you know, they don't want everybody under Medicare, you're going to have to try to figure out a way to do it through employees, employers rather, and that means you've got to start looking at certain employers differently than other employers because the small, small businesses can't afford it. Well, certainly large corporations can and so it's going to be complicated. And um, so I think, I think Wisconsin will probably follow Massachusetts' lead, uh, that great conservative Republican, Mitt Romney, newly, a newly born again <laughs> conservative. Um, Good man. Yeah. Good man. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, well, the Republicans think he's a good man, yeah. but I, I, I really think we're going to probably try some sort of, uh, as Cal said, the approach would be pretty much employer uh, assist, assist uh, uh, employer provided health care with some subsidies for small businesses, some kind of a mix like that, and see if that works. Um, you know, but I think it's 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 it is that you're bringing a huge political group groups of political people uh, with large amounts of money to bear. I have friends who are in the healthcare industry. They're spending their time, you know, these, these sales reps are just spending gobs of money. At, you know, it's good for Stefano and, and his restaurants. You know, entertaining people to push people to use, dr you know, drugs that may, they may or may not, well, they may or may not mm -hmm. need or preferential treatment. And I can't tell you, oftentimes I, get, I walk in and I get, you know, samples of things. You know, I'm one of the lucky ones that actually gets inside the doctor's door and they say, well, Ken, try this. You know, we've got a bunch of samples lying around here. So the waste in the system is extraordinary. And no one wants to confront that either. Okay. So. Well, it'll be interesting, but I think it should be a pull-out discussion. Yeah. And oh, I yeah. think it could bring out the best in citizens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know I'm being a little no, bit Pollyannish. I, I, I would ask, you know, I mean, I just recently came across, you know, public employees and how much they contribute to their insurance. Yeah. Um, single digit. Mm. Where other maybe private sectors are double digit. Mm -hmm. When the public employees step forward and say, I'll contribute double digit on around a 20 percent, well, and maybe part of that goes to help fund a program like this, right. then that'll be a good discussion. And since, you're a, and, since you, and since you're a public, <laughs> a, you're a public employee, I'm a public employee. <laughs> that, that's not a problem. Well, we're again, we're a, wrapping it is, up. It's a very complicated issue because from the public employee's point of view, they negotiated those, those benefits in lieu of actual financial, you know, especially in our case where we face a 3.8 cap. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you say how much money do you want in your wallet as opposed to how much money do you want in your benefits, and you make those conscious decisions at the negotiating table. All right. All I can say in, in, in closing is be careful what bridges you drive over, and hopefully we'll all gather together again yeah. next month to talk about other interesting issues. Thanks for joining us.